Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brains Blog Roundtables. My name is Dan Bernson, and I am the co-managing editor of the Brains Blog, along with Nick Bird. Uh, very excited to uh, do another one of these. I think this is our fourth one that we're doing, and they've been a lot of fun so far, and I'm really excited about today's topic and today's panel. So today's topic is animal consciousness. What is the nature of animal consciousness? Uh, which critters have conscious experiences and which don't, and how do we tell? Uh, how do I know whether my cat is angry at me or not, for instance? Um, I was pretty convinced that our former cat was angry and felt contempt all the time. How do I know whether I'm right about that? Um, so uh, jokes aside, this is a very important and interesting topic for a lot of reasons, both philosophical and scientific. In philosophy, you might think of this as like a particularly compelling case of the problem of other minds. So how do we reason about, theorize about, the conscious experiences of creatures who we assume are cognitively unlike us in a number of ways. And for the same reason, you might think of it as a particularly challenging test case for consciousness science in general. How do we theorize about the conscious experience? Uh, how do we investigate the conscious experience of creatures in light of those same differences? And then of course, uh, there's a bunch of further ramifications, uh, social and ethical upshots. So thinking about things like animal welfare policy, thinking about things like food ethics. So it kind of runs the gamut from very philosophical questions all the way to very uh, social and important policy questions. So that is the topic for today. I'm really excited about the panel that we have. Um, I've started just doing introductions counterclockwise on my screen. I don't know if that makes any, uh, if that's how it's gonna show up for everyone. Uh, but anyway, so we'll go in that direction. So uh, Liz, that makes you first. Our first panelist is Liz Irvine who is a senior lecturer in the philosophy department at Cardiff University. Um, Liz has worked extensively on consciousness science more generally, as well as cognitive neuroscience and linguistics. And I think, I don't know if it's accurate to say the move into animal consciousness has been a little bit more recent, um, but doing significant work on that right now, including, so one of the, Liz, one of the issues you've written about a lot is measurement in consciousness science, including like introspective measurements, are they reliable? And some of the, your recent work has been in applying that to uh, measurements of animal consciousness, like animal pain, correct? Um, yeah, so that's really exciting stuff. And I'm uh, happy, uh, looking forward to talking about that. Uh, Liz is also the author of the 2012 book, Consciousness as a Scientific Concept, as well as the editor of the more recent volume, Andy Clark and His Critics, which I assume was a lot of fun. Um, yes. <laughs> <here and there. laughs> yeah. um, cool. Uh, so Liz, thanks so much for, for joining us. And looking forward to, to your thoughts today. Um, next up on my screen, going counterclockwise, is Rachel, Rachel Brown, uh, who is a senior lecturer in philosophy, as well as the director uh, of the Center for the Philosophy of the Sciences at Australian National University, where I got to spend a, couple, a little bit of time a couple of years ago. And it's a really phenomenal place with so many great philosophers of mind and philosophers of science, um, of whom Rachel is certainly one. Um, so Rachel works very broadly on the relationship between evolution and cognition, I think is a, 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 maybe a fair way to put it. No? Well, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That, that, that seems fair. I mean, yeah, there's many ways one could describe my yeah. work. Well, so I, I, the next up for me is I have a list of the particular issues. So issues in cultural evolution, um, the inheritance of social structures, including evident, uh, inheritance of social structures by animals, which I didn't really know much about and find very interesting and exciting. Um, issues in comparative cognition and comparative cognitive evolution, um, and also some new stuff on the nature of behavioral innovation, which I uh, find really interesting and am looking forward to, I happen to know that you have a forthcoming PSA paper on that, that I'm looking forward to seeing come out. Uh, so uh, a bunch of really interesting issues in that, in that uh, sphere. Um, also, is it, uh, can I share that you've got a, a book manuscript under contract? Yeah, you can share that. Uh, so the so the book is I uh, think entitled the in evolved mind, uh, forthcoming with Cambridge University Press in their series Cambridge. Elements. So it's been delayed by babies and then COVID and then yeah. So it's 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 been a lot in long gestation, but it's coming. Well, so I've started telling people that I'm going to write a book, assuming that if I tell enough people, I will eventually you know do it. Uh, but I don't even have a contract yet. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's uh, super exciting and looking forward to uh, when that comes up. Uh, so thanks, Rachel, so much for being here. Uh, last but certainly not least, Jonathan Birch is an associate professor in the Department of Logic, sorry, Philosophy, Logic, and the Scientific Method at the London School of Economics. Um, 
also the, the principal investigator of a project called the Foundations of Animal Sentience, uh, funded by the European Research Council. Uh, Jonathan has written a, a very wide range of papers on animal consciousness, including also the ethics surrounding animal consciousness. Um, and while that stuff is the focus for today, also shouldn't neglect, uh, John, your significant work in um, social evolution, including uh, the 2017 book from Oxford University Press, uh, Philosophy of Social Evolution. Uh, so Jonathan, thanks so much for uh, being here today. Um, so I wanna go around and I wanna have all of you uh, just give us a brief introduction to your research, um, sort of a little bit about the kind of stuff you do, but also maybe a little bit about what you're currently working on and why that's uh, exciting to you. Uh, so what, why don't we go in reverse order this time? Uh, Jonathan, do you wanna, do you wanna get us started? Yes, I'm Jonathan Birch. I'm an associate professor at the LSE. I'm principal investigator on the Foundations of Animal Sentience project, which I think of as, as having two sides. There's the science facing side that is about how do we develop better methods for studying the subjective feelings of animals scientifically. And then there's a policy facing side that is really about how do we design better policies, laws and ways of caring for animals that are informed by this emerging science of animal sentience, animal feeling. And yeah, I suppose I'm working on both sides simultaneously. We, we recently produced a report for the UK government that led to some protections of, of a kind being extended to octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, crabs, and lobsters in UK animal welfare law. And we've also got an experimental part of the project that is working with particularly Lars Chitka and, and Ellie Ledbetter on experiments involving bees and, and trying to test the hypothesis that bees are sentient. So a lot going on and yeah, new, new stuff coming out all the time. Yeah, great. I mean, that just immediately spans all the whole realm of the philosophical, the empirical and the, and the policy making. Yeah, that's so, the idea. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That's, that's really, really cool. We love to see uh, projects like that. Um, that uh, span those those arenas so that's great um uh so thanks uh rachel do you want to go next uh so uh as uh dan already well kind of summarized i'm a bit of a magpie <laughs> i'm interested in lots of different things but the thing that sort of unifies all of the the different sort of threads of my work is an interest in uh evolutionary arguments and how that how they're used and in particular how they're used to make claims about cognition in animals and uh in humans and so I'm interested in animal um, consciousness and, and animal cognition in, in particular, but partly it's, it's about kind of understanding how we make the claims that we make about animal cognition and, and consciousness. Um, the big project I'm sort of working towards at the moment um, is to do with the building blocks of culture and thinking about what are the minimal requirements for um, culture and then what the implications of that are, but also how we can kind of come to know when we're in a case where we have um, culture. Cool. Yeah. So the comparative arguments come up uh, very, very centrally in uh, the uh, animal consciousness literature as well. So definitely really rich source of things to, to draw on today. Uh, great. Uh, Liz, do you want to take us around the bend and then we'll and then we'll hop in? Yeah. So I think, Dan, you kind of already said what I do. <laughs> uh, I've worked for a while on methodological questions in primarily in human consciousness science. Um, so how do you tell whether somebody is consciously perceiving something versus unconsciously perceiving something? Um, so that's kind of really basic questions about measurement and um, yeah. Um, so when I kind of first started getting into that, human consciousness science had only really recently been recognized as something that was a legitimate science, that was a legitimate thing for psychologists to study. Um, and I think that has, but at that time, people, I mean, I don't think people were really talking about animal consciousness yet. That was still seen as this slightly weird taboo thing that you couldn't really say anything sensible about. Um, but in the last kind of five to 10 years, people have started talking about animal consciousness. Um, and there's lots of really amazing work going on there. Um, so, so I kind of, yeah, started to get more into non-human animal consciousness too, but similar kinds of methodological questions to do with 
how do we come up with good tests? What counts as a good test for, for an organism being sentient? And I think that's way more complicated in the human case, um, or rather it's way more complicated than the human case. Um, Cause there's never gonna be a single test that is gonna plausibly work for every organism. It's, it's a much more complicated kind of set of questions to think about, so. You think there's a single test in the human case? Well, no, but <laughs> it's at least a bit more plausible there, given that you're just dealing with human biology. If you're dealing with lots of other species with different brains and bodies, you might expect there to be less. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, and that, I mean, even that just gets us right into the <laughs> gets us right into the first question, right? So the <clears throat> thing I wanted to really start out with was to ask each of you. Uh, to kind of say a little more about, you know, can, can we put a little meat on exactly why this is so difficult? So uh, we all admit that human consciousness science is, is difficult. Uh, what makes uh, studying animal consciousness particularly challenging? You, you know, it might be as simple as they can't say what they're feeling, but as many people have pointed out, including uh, Liz in, in her work, is that, uh, you know, just asking people what they're feeling is not always the best guide to uh, understanding their, their conscious experience. Um, so given that consciousness science in general is hard, uh, can we, can we say a little more? Can we, can we put some meat on, on why it's particularly hard studying animal consciousness? What do you think some of the central problems are, uh, distinctive to that? Um, uh, so Jonathan, I thought maybe I'd ask you to get us started and then we can, can go around and see what everyone thinks here. I don't know how distinctive the problems are. It's an interesting question. I and mean, whenever you're studying conscious experience at all, you've got these problems that don't arise in a lot of psychology and a lot of cognitive science because you're explicitly not studying properties that are easily definable in functional terms or computational terms. You're trying to get to the other stuff. You're trying to get to what it feels like to be doing all that computation. And so consciousness in general is this notoriously difficult thing to study because the sort of methods we normally use for accessing functional states are not necessarily getting us to the subjective experience. So all that is there in the human case. In humans, at least, I suppose humans have a, are often thought to be relatively good experimental subjects because they will sit still and you can control the stimuli they're exposed to very precisely and you can get them to report in novel but very controlled ways. And I think the paradigm of that is verbal report where you'd get people to say what they've just seen, but that's not the only way. It could be pressing a key, it could be lots of different things, but it can be novel and yet you know, very reliable. That's the real holy grail of animal consciousness research, I think, where you have a huge problem in the first place getting them to stay still, getting them into those controlled laboratory conditions where you can precisely control the, the stimuli you're exposing them to. And then even when you've got over that, how do you get them to respond reliably in a way that is indicative of what they're experiencing? I think you can get some insight into how hard those challenges are to overcome by looking at a recent paper by Nida et al in Science that was aiming to study neural correlates of consciousness in crows in a way that closely parallels the way they're studied in humans. And crows are notoriously very trainable animals, so you can actually train them to perform report-like behaviors. So what they did was train them to, it's too complicated to explain all the details now, but essentially to use their head, head bobbing movements to indicate whether they'd seen something or not, which is quite ingenious, but I think it took something like um, 40,000 trials, something like that, to train them properly to do that. And so, you know, compare that to the human case where you can get a naive subject into the lab who's never been an experimental subject before, tell them to report what they're seeing and they're doing it. Um, that to me is the, the massive difference that makes translating methods from human consciousness science to non-human animals, even though it's very important to try, unbelievably difficult to, to succeed. 
Yeah, that's, and you know, every behaviorist, behavioral experimenter who I've looked at or talked to, um, they always say, you know, the training is, is itself so difficult that, um, yeah. yeah. It's this sort of related worry that if you're training them that much, so if you're training them through 40,000 trials, to what extent can you rely that rely on what the report is doing is genuinely reporting the conscious experience rather than this being this incredibly trained unconscious processing because we you know when we've done something 40,000 times we're not really thinking about it anymore are we you know yeah. and that the, the worry is that might be true of the animals as well yeah I mean, uh, Liz, Rachel, I mean, Liz, this, this seems to link up with some of your stuff about conscious and unconscious um, perception as well. Do you, want, do you have anything you want to add here? Yeah, I mean, I guess that maybe a slightly obvious point that at least in the kind of, at least when you're investigating human consciousness, there are a range of core cases about which people tend to agree that <laughs> in these situations, yeah. you do perceive things consciously. And a lot of the debate is basically around where the boundaries are between, say, conscious and unconscious perception or wake versus sleep states. Um, so you've at least got kind of some central core cases that you can start with and then move out from. But in the animal consciousness case, you don't have those. Um, yeah. Which makes it a lot harder. Uh, like paradigm cases, yeah. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I think. I think the other challenge, which is a typical challenge in study of animal minds in general, is that, you know, that we've got sort of our particular way of doing a particular thing, and then we have to make inferences from that as to what other organisms are doing. And something like, say, consciousness, it looks like there's going to be lots and lots of different types of consciousness. There's not necessarily kind of just what we have and then grades of that. There's going to be variation within that. Um, and in the consciousness case, it's particularly gnarly because it's hard for us to really think about kind of grades of that. Um, and that's a problem for comparative psychology in general. So you, you see that with thinking about, say, theory of mind or um, causal reasoning. But in a way, the in the consciousness case, it's just it seems even harder than in those other cases because you don't have exactly, as Jonathan said, that kind of functional grip on what's going on, um, a way to sort of... Um, avoid anthropocentric kind of um, attribution. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the fact that it's not just that you're, you've got one phenomena that we've really got a clear bound around. Um, you've got all of these phenomena that are quite kind of, they're related. We think that they're all related, um, but there's grades and, 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 and differences. Um, and so it, it becomes really, really difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, when a property is, is functional, it's, much easier to get a clear grip i think of what that property is and it's much easier to get a clear grip of how there can be gradations in it and when it comes to consciousness you know, people don't agree on what it is and it's incredibly hard to get our heads around the idea of it potentially having gradations well and, and variation so think about the octopus case right so what's it like to be an octopus we're, we we're pretty sure it's really different to what it's like to be a human but then when it comes to kind of exactly what what the different parameters are for for cashing that out it, it gets really messy really fast well so i was actually i was going to do a little bit of a straw poll later about about the octopus but i mean we we could do it now right so yeah you know the octopus has been a, a kind of case of animal consciousness that's become a little bit of a public darling um, so there was Peter Godfrey Smith's, you know, very interesting book uh, a couple of years ago, but also there have been documentaries that have kind of highlighted uh, the complexity of, of octopus behavior and have, you know, attributed all kinds of higher order conscious and mental states to them on the basis of that behavior. Um, you know, there's been TED talks about this and stuff like that. So I don't know, why don't we just dive in? You know, what's, what's going on with the octopus? Does anyone, does anyone think they know? <laughs> Is, what was the straw poll? How do we answer that as a poll? Um, well, so we can start out, are, are they conscious or not conscious? Yes. I think so. Yes, probably. They're conscious, so, yeah. So then the other thing I was going to ask is, um, is there, so sometimes you see this claim, and I don't actually recall how strongly PGS makes this claim, but he at least flirts with it, you know, that like 
octopus consciousness is a fundamentally different kind of consciousness or, or octopus experience is uh, very much different from the kind of experience we have. Is that something you all would agree with or do you, uh, do, are we not able to tell? It's, you know, it's a particularly, given the, the behavioral and neuroanatomical differences of this particular creature, you might say it's a, it's a particularly challenging case of, of something like this. So I forget who I had in the outline for this. Maybe this was, uh, maybe this was you, Liz. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. Um, I guess maybe for people who aren't familiar with it, um, the, the kind of the weird thing about octopuses is that most of their neurons aren't in their head. They are, yeah. most of them are located um, at the kind of top of each of their eight arms. Um, and the arms can operate fairly autonomously of each other and of whatever's going on in the kind of central head area. Um, so the organism can sometimes sit there and the arms will apparently be doing completely autonomous things. And then a split second later, it seems to be a kind of unified organism where the arms are under the control of, of some kind of central system. And so then the question is like, what <laughs> what is going on? What, yeah, what kind of experiences where is the subject? How many minds are in there? What is it like to have most of your Maybe brain? Maybe nine. Yeah. Like, what is <laughs> going on there? Um, so I think that Godfrey Smith's approach to this sounds plausible to me, <laughs> which is the idea that, um, that there is still a kind of single subject there. So it's not like each arm has its own individual subject of awareness, um, but that what kind of amounts to the subject that's having conscious experiences shifts between it just being the head and it being the head plus all the stuff going on in the arms. So there's still just a single kind of point of view or a single locus of experience, but what contributes to it changes. <laughs> I think we, we don't know enough about what what it is that sort of binds different conscious contents together into a single unified point of view yeah. to be able to adjudicate that question. I've spoken to Jennifer Mather about it. You know, Jennifer's a lifelong octopus expert, just amazing wealth of knowledge on these issues. She's quite skeptical of the whole, you know, different minds in the arms thing she thinks it's rather overblown and says well just just think of you of yourself you're twiddling your thumbs and yeah, doing yeah. these idle habits yeah there's a lot of stuff we just sort of do without a huge amount of top-down control yeah. but it doesn't mean that there's a separate um it doesn't mean there's separate conscious subject in the cerebellum for example so you know Bather thinks you know, octopuses might not be that different from us in that respect that when there's whole organism behavior going on there's top-down executive control of it just like in us and it's not all that different but i suppose in the in the end we don't have enough um knowledge of what what underlies a conscious state in the first place to be able to settle that one way or the other yeah i i am yeah I, just because i was thinking about this today very sympathetic to that idea that it's not maybe that different to how our brains work. It's just that ours are all in one place <laughs> and theirs aren't. I, I, right. I yeah. had a similar thought the other day about kind of, I was thinking about um, lateralization and, you know, if you're an organism with binocular vision, maybe there's kind of a more sense of a single, you know, it's easier to imagine a single awareness, like a single sense of, or a single phenomenal experience. Whereas, you know, something like, um, a, a guinea pig or a, a mouse with really kind of highly kind of um, a, a vision that's not so integrated, um, then I d it feels like the octopus case is is a bit like that. It's just more market because of the way that it's arranged in the sense that everything's more distributed um, in space, but is it really all that different? Um, yeah. I mean, again, this comes back though to that kind of central nub question though, you know, what is it that consciousness is? And if we don't have a really good answer to that question, then it's hard for us to characterize sort of different aspects of, of that thing. I find unihemispheric sleep fascinating in this context that even yes. dolphins, apparently one hemisphere of the brain will sleep while the other half is awake. 
I mean, it's helpful if you're trying to stay in the water, not yeah. sink, you know, but ex absolutely extraordinary. And does that mean they're two conscious subjects? We we don't really know. You, you've got the, the the two subjects model of those sorts of cases, but you've all, you've also got a, a sort of switch model. It's mm -hmm. one conscious subject, but the mechanisms supporting it are flipping from one hemisphere to the right and flip a B. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, there's a philosophical debate about split brain cases in humans that yeah. Elizabeth yeah. Schechter and Tim Bain and other people have um, talked about. Uh, so yeah, even in those cases, it's, it's a little hard to know. It's very um, natural to connect those debates, yeah, and to look to the significant literature on those split brain syndrome cases in humans for, for inspiration of what the possibilities are in relation to animals. I'm not sure it tells us much more than that. It tells us what the possibilities are, but not yeah. which one is correct. Yeah. I mean, I think another thing that's interesting that comes out of this is sort of there's differences in, in kind and differences in degree, and it's a little bit hard to know. So, I mean, one thing that kind of came out was like degrees of unified experience depending on one's sensory apparatus and so forth. Um, and of course, sensory experience is going to change depending on the nature of the sensory apparatus. So all those things are kind of compatible with the general type of consciousness being similar in the sense that it might be the yeah. experience of a single subject or, or something like that. So it's a little hard to tell like when the difference in kind comes in versus a, a kind yeah. of just different. I mean, you get lots of different contents. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one really cool thing about octopuses is that they don't see color. So they don't see the wavelength of light, which is not that easy to see underwater anyway. You know, yeah. and, but they do see the plane of polarization Right. So they, they see a variable, the parameter of the light that we just don't yeah. register at all. So when you're thinking about what it's like to be an octopus, well, what is it like to see the plane of polarization rather than the wavelength? And then their arms are full of idea. kind of sensory um, sort of aspects that we don't really have. And it's hard to kind of contemplate what it would be like to have that kind of input mm -hmm. coming in. Um, yeah. Right. That that's a rich chemo sensation exactly. in your arms. You know, what what would it be like to smell through your arms? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but but of course, I mean, all of that's compatible with like the nature of our consciousness being the same, just with massively different sensory inputs. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it does kind of yeah. highlight this this challenge though of how to how far to go from our own experience of consciousness. So, you know, do we do we decide that unity is really essential to kind of what we, what we think um, it is to be a conscious being um, or or do we decide that that's just anthropocentric or um, um, to think that that's kind of fundamental? Um, and I think that's one of the real challenges in this literature is you can either be quite kind of permissive or you can be, you can be really um, chauvinistic about what you decide counts um but you there's where you draw the line it's not really it's not clear to me that the science tells us where to draw the line it's going to be something about what what we decide about the concept um but hard to know what is anthropocentric and what isn't in this exactly area. when it yeah. comes to consciousness yeah yeah well so i mean this actually this leads right into the next thing so we kind of started out like how, how do we, what are the tr problems and difficulties in extrapolating from the thing we think we understand, which is human consciousness towards the animal um, kingdom? But I was actually gonna ask is, you know, is, can we ask the question the other way around? And Rachel, I was gonna, you know, maybe you can just carry on here. Um, it, what can we learn about, if anything, about human consciousness from studying other organisms? I mean, it might be, as Jonathan said, you know, we learn about possibilities or something like that. Um, but it seems to me you could ask the question in either direction, so. Uh, I don't know, do we have thoughts about that? Uh, Rachel, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, in, I mean, the whole field of comparative psychology in some respects is in part um, about thinking about uh, the similarities and differences between different species and, and what those can tell us about at various things. So you can think that uh, looking at animal consciousness can help us to understand the evolution of consciousness. Um, thinking about animal consciousness can help us understand variation in human consciousness. So if we think about cases of, of um, where people have um, uh, minimal consciousness when they've had an injury or even just the thought that maybe there's variations within human uh, experience that we haven't really explored in, in a lot of depth. I mean, we know that there is variation, right? So if you think about just um, colour vision, we know that some people are much better at detecting different um, grades within colours 
Um, and so what's it, what's it like to be that person compared to someone else? Um, how different is that question to kind of the, what's it like to be the, the octopus with this really different kind of um, way of, of, of seeing? Uh, so I think the animal cases are important because they can help us flesh out those grades um, and help us to learn about what the significant um, sort of uh, factors are or which parameters we should be interested uh, in exploring in the human case. But I guess the, again, we end up with this sort of back and forth question. Um, I mean, I, I think any part of, any part of this area of science, we do end up sort of in a bit of a kind of, we look at what, what we think that, what we think is going on in the human case. So, um, what's it like for humans to do, um, to have this particular type of experience. And then we go and try and explore what it's, what's going on in the animal cases. And that can help us to refine what's going, what we think about the human case. And, and we go back and forth and hopefully over time, we kind of come to, to know more. Um, but it does seem like um, there's always going to be this back and forth reciprocal kind of, the more we learn about the animal cases, the more they can, the more we understand our cases in, in a rich way, but vice versa. So, so I was just going to hop in, you know, speaking as a colorblind person, actually, I'm not sure that y'all are be any better off with me than you are with the octopus, right? So you can study my color discriminations that I can make, but you ask me in what way is my experience different? I'm like, I have no idea, right? Um, so in a sense, like I'm not in any better subject than the octopus is when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to color vision. Uh, sorry, jo uh, Jonathan, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you, were you going to hop in there? No, you didn't cut me off. Are you completely colorblind? Oh, no, 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 no. I just, uh, uh, I'm some kind of anomalous deuter in a red green. Uh, okay. I, I tried to get it measured in a lab once at UC San Diego, but their machine mm. was on the fritz. So I'm, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree with what Rachel was just saying. I think that ultimately, if we want to understand consciousness at all, we have to understand its manifestations in non human systems. I don't think there's any viable path that involves reaching a complete understanding purely through studying humans. That doesn't really make any sense. And, and you can get a sense of that by considering popular theories of consciousness in the science at the moment, like the global workspace theory that links conscious experience to a, a representation entering this mechanism called the global workspace where information from many different inputs comes in and is integrated and is broadcast back and broadcast onwards to a wide range of consumer systems. So sort of theory of what's going on in the human cortex that leads to conscious experience. But then you, you immediately start to wonder which elements of that are, are really necessary and, and which bits of it are, are surplus to requirements. So which bits could you knock out and still have a mechanism that generates conscious experience and unless we can answer that question we're not really getting any understanding of what what conscious experience is and so inevitably you know pure only studying the mechanisms that are there in humans doesn't really give us any understanding of which bits are, are needed and which bits could be replaced or achieved in other ways so i suppose there's I disagree with the idea that the, the viability of a science of human consciousness is independent of the viability of a science of animal consciousness. I think if there's no, if there's no viable science of animal consciousness, then there isn't really a serious science of human consciousness either. Yeah, that's a, that's a really nice way of putting it. I like that, I like that point. Um, uh, Liz, do you have anything to add on this or? Um, and just maybe a quick thing that, I think one of the exciting things that animal consciousness can offer to human consciousness science is is kind of presenting maybe a wider range of theoretical possibilities than we might have traditionally considered in in human consciousness science um yeah um there are lots of assumptions that are made about consciousness in human consciousness science that you know some people don't agree with but the majority do and i think looking at animal consciousness science can maybe <laughs> change what we think of the kind of base assumptions should be, yeah. And, and I think, you know, again, we see an analog here with um, broader movements in comparative cognition and biological cognition, where there I think 
a very similar thing goes on where it's like, okay, well, if we admit in the possibility that plants are cognizers or bacteria are cognizers, how does that enrich the, our, our thoughts, theor theoretical uh, perspectives on what the phenomenon is, right? And I think there's a yeah. kind of structural analog in this, in this discussion as well. And um, there's also another sense in which it's important. Um, so, I mean, we can think about kind of, I mean, if we're talking about comparative psychology, but if we're, if we're thinking about kind of animal models and things like that, then it seems like there's so much we'd like to, if, as Jonathan says, if we're really going to understand consciousness, we really need to sort of be able to not just describe what's going on in the human case, but understand what the levers are that make a difference to how people experience things. And unless we're willing to radically change our approach to kind of the ethics of human research, then it looks like we, we, we are going to be um, studying consciousness um, by looking at model organisms like mice and rats and things like that. Yeah, 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 great point. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up on that by doing the thing I do at least once in every one of these, which is go off the outline. Um, there's something uh, that that directly speaks to, which I've been a little, I would say concerned about, but it has kind of puzzled me. And that is what role that sort of comparative neuroscience um, plays in this, in this discussion. So I occasionally teach a 2016 paper by Colin Klein and Andrew Barron uh, arguing for the present for consciousness in bees on the basis of neuroanatomical uh, homologies to humans. Um, now, of course, bees don't have a cortex; they have a different integrative area called a mushroom body, right? So the there the argument is like, well, it, it subsumes kind of the same function of integrating information that the human cortex does. Um, do you all have thoughts about this this kind of move? Is it uh, not to not to uh, not to shine the light on uh, Colin and An Andy's paper specifically, but uh, wh what do you all think about this as a as a methodology or as part of a methodology for thinking about this stuff? I just kind of throw that open. It's not it's not on the outline, but yeah, I have also taught that paper. <laughs> um, they make what I always used to think was a slightly weird claim in that paper was that like a proper making kind of strong claims about animal sentience had to rely on neurophysiology and behavioral data wasn't really useful and that always kind of puzzled me a bit <laughs> um i mean i guess the idea is that behavioral data is difficult to interpret um, but so is the neurophysiological stuff. And I think we only really know what the neurophysiology of bees does by looking at behavioral data anyway. So um, it definitely has to play a role in making inferences about animal sentience, but it doesn't seem to me like it can be the primary source of the data. Um, I guess if you think what it is to be conscious is to have a certain type of um, neurological architecture or, or general kind of structure, then uh, yes, psychology, yes, behavior is important um, to the science of uh, consciousness. But really, when it comes down to it, how I decide whether this thing or that thing is conscious is kind of irrelevant. It, it, sorry, their behavior is kind of irrelevant if they have the right kind of structure but the problem would be the problem then is how do you find out what the right structure is right without going in and looking at the cases so I mean I think Andy in particular is concerned that um, there is going to be lots of organisms like say bees where their behavior isn't necessarily going to be indicative of consciousness when we use the standard metrics but then you know ultimately it will turn out that they they satisfy some kind of underlying kind of structure that we think is the right kind of structure to have consciousness. But mm. I'm with you, Liz. I don't. I don't know that you can kind of get to that structure without starting from behaviour. Yeah. I think looking at behaviour is probably a pretty good bet when we're looking at invertebrates. We know that if they have conscious experience, it will be evolved substantially separately from our own instance of it, and will involve substantially different neural mechanisms. Now that's compatible with there turning out to be interesting similarities, but I don't think the, the case is ever going to be convincing if it only rests on those intriguing similarities of neural processing. 
for example, gamma oscillations being found in both cases, because the sort of features we're talking about there are inevitably quite high level features where we're not quite sure how tight the link to conscious experience is. I think that our best bet of building up a, a really robust case is through carefully characterizing as fine a grain as we can the cognitive profile of conscious experience and then looking to see if we find that cognitive profile those cognitive signatures in invertebrates so that's it's almost a question of taste i suppose it's a claim about what i think the best bet is methodologically rather than something that i can say has, has been vindicated it's just it's just my bet and you could you could see these different kind of perspectives kind of all coming together at, at some stage right where you think there's a certain kind of maybe complexity of behavior, if not type of behavior, uh, a certain kind of cognitive operationalization of consciousness, maybe it's integration of information, right? Which is another popular sort of general perspective on what consciousness is. And then it might turn out that that's the basis for homology claims about um, other neural areas that are involved in producing conscious experience. I mean, to some degree, it might just, it might be a starting point where, where you start out in that process. Um, yeah, I mean, the strategy that I set out in my paper on the search for invertebrate consciousness is basically one of characterizing the cognitive profile as carefully as we can, and then looking for other instances of it in nature. And then, you know, of course, then it makes a lot of sense to ask, is there something interesting going on at the neural level that is common to both of these cases? So, for example, is, is recurrent processing involved in both cases in achieving that cognitive profile? As people like Victor Lamb would would hypothesize, so you can then you know look, look at your other your other instance of this cognitive kind to test hypotheses about whether the neural mechanisms are the are the same or not. But I feel as though you, uh, uh, the best bet is to start by looking at the cognitive profile um, and then to think about the neural underpinnings of it, rather than the other way around. Just to clarify, Dan, um, it's a long time since I read the paper. Are they saying that the case it's a case of convergence or homology, right? If I recall it correctly, and I may be misremembering, I, re I recall it being a, a case of homology. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it is, right? I think so. So then the idea is that there's some kind of extremely ancient, extremely ancient trait that's uh, no, present. No. I don't mean that. Well, no, I just can't remember. I think. Yeah, no, I can't remember. I have to yeah, have a yeah, look we're, again. We're, you're struggling to reconstruct the paper from memory. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, the. Um, I mean, the, must it, be convergence. Merker's no, Merker's theory is is central to it. So Bjorn Merker's theory that ties conscious yeah, experience that. to the to the midbrain, very controversially, um, mm. rather rather than to the cortex, um, and then the claim is that insects have mechanisms that are functionally analogous to the vertebrate midbrain now that's compatible with there being some homologous genes that are responsible in the two cases but um but i think if you looked at the last common ancestor of humans and bees it's not going to have those those structures yeah so i mean it seems like it depends on i mean it's again that kind of deep homology kind of question whether you'd, you'd want to say that um if there were it's sort of like pac 6 is a gene that you see in uh, octopus it, it, uh, and in um, humans associated with vision, but um, there's also cases of animals with pac 6 that don't have vision. So it's it's a you know it's common in those cases. It looks like it's involved yeah, in vision. But... To... That's right. Yeah. When we talk about, as I said earlier, you know, if consciousness is there in invertebrates, it's evolved separately. We shouldn't overstate that you know, by pretending there's no common ancestor at all, and of course there was, and um, assuming that there's no conserved genes at all mm. in the two cases, because they could well turn out to be. But nonetheless, there is this 500 million years plus of different evolutionary history. Right. So those structures and mechanisms will have evolved substantially differently. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I might have thrown that off a little bit by speaking loosely uh, about homology. Uh, maybe I just meant functional analogs. Um, maybe it's more broadly interesting in how we yeah. think about consciousness, right? So if you think that, I mean, if you think that consciousness is something which has you know, evolved more than once, but also if you think that there is 
many different ways in which you can have consciousness or if there's it's a relatively kind of narrow pool of possibilities for how consciousness can be um then that's going to make a difference as to kind of how again how chauvinistic or how liberal you are with your attributions of consciousness yeah it's cool. a remarkable thing how many genes that are linked to learning are conserved right across the animals mm-hmm. um it's amazing, really. We can't make a similar claim about genes linked to consciousness because we don't know the distribution of consciousness. But insofar as you think there might be a, a deep connection between conscious experience and learning, as, as I do and as, as Eva Jablonka and Simona Ginsburg have argued, there is. it's very interesting to then see that there are these remarkable homologies of learning across the vertebrates and invertebrates. Mm. Yeah, cool. Um... Okay, so I want to I want to stay on uh, course here. I want to I did want to come back to this idea of measurement. So um, we've kind of floated around this a little bit, and it does seem like, uh, as we sort of talked about early on, there's a a, a particular set of challenges involved in measurement with uh, animal consciousness. Uh, so I, was, I wanted to ask you if there are you know, any particular measures that you find particularly compelling? Um, are there particular mo- measures that are popular that are you, you are not so um, inspired by? Uh, how do we think about the, the measurement of animal consciousness specifically? Um, Liz, do you want to start us on this? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a couple of different ways that you might think about measuring or testing um whether a particular organism is conscious or not um i'm only going to talk about two of them but maybe jonathan can talk about his his different approach when it gets to him um so you might think that there are very general abilities that we might associate with consciousness um so one might be inter- information of integration which dan talked about with you already so the idea is if an organism is able to combine and integrate information from a range of sources, whether that's sensory sources or from memory, and then act on that integrated information that is maybe associated with that organism being conscious. Um, All right, and there's a whole different range of ways of caching that out, but that's at least a kind of generic idea. Um, There's the idea that Jonathan talked about and might say more about, that uh, we might associate consciousness with the ability for an organism to do a wide range of very flexible types of learning. Um, So there are some sort of very general approaches to thinking about what abilities we associate with consciousness and we can develop tests based based on those. Um, There's also kind of tests of sentience that are much more specific, say to different types of conscious experience so in the animal welfare literature there are kind of battery of of neurophysiological and behavioral tests that you might do to see whether an organism is capable of having pain experiences Um, and there's other ways of of trying to come up with tests too Um, uh, so yeah i i still don't really know what i think a lot about a lot of these but i think there are two things that I want to spend more time thinking about. So one is for both these kind of general approaches and the more specific approaches, to what extent are these tests or these criteria actually genuinely independent of each other? Um, It might turn out that um, these kind of abilities or these tests are actually all kind of different ways of getting at the same underlying capacity or feature um and that would be kind of theoretically interesting um but it would also be really practically significant to find that out particularly if we're doing specific tests of pain experiences if it turns out that five of these tests are basically tests of the same thing then by doing these five tests we're not actually learning anything new (laughs) compared to just doing one of them um so that would also be good to know so i guess yeah question one like are the range of abilities and tests that we have genuinely independent of each other to begin with? Um, And then the second is just this kind of slow process of just spending time with each ability or each specific test to really figure out 
what its connection to consciousness actually is. So um, I've done this with some of the behavioral measures of pain experiences. Um, and I think a lot of them aren't <laughs> obviously tied to consciousness very well. Um, and I think partly this is because some of the behaviors that people talk about, like protective behaviors or trade-off behaviors, um, appear like kind of conscious, um, you know, appear like complex behaviors, but you can actually have very simple systems that generate complex behaviors. So um, people have said that um, a good test of an organism being sentient is that when you do something nasty to it, it engages in protective or guarding behaviors. So it will kind of guard the injured site. Um, and the another very popular one is um, if an organism engages in trade-off behavior, so they trade off internal states of say pain or hunger in flexible ways, that is often taken to be an indicator that uh, they are having conscious pain experiences. Um, I think there are very simple ways of generating those behaviors. Um, and so I don't think that at least in a general way, these are good tests of, of sentience. Um, but there might be others that are. So, so yeah, I think we like we just need to do a lot more work on it first. <laughs> um, um, yeah. It's good to have a lot more evidence from humans, I would say. So much of the work in human consciousness science has been aimed at you know, trying to uncover the particular brain regions, et cetera, and neural mechanisms that are linked to conscious experience in us, which is parochial. You know, and it's it's telling us relatively little about what might be going on in other animals. To me, the really interesting questions are, are these that I've been describing about the cognitive profile of consciousness. So conscious perception, I think, it's very likely to facilitate lots of different things that are harder to do when you're not consciously perceiving the stimulus. And what would be great is to have lots more evidence about what those abilities actually are. And it, it could be that the sort of trade-off behavior Liz is describing is one of those, you know, that maybe it is facilitated by conscious experience of the things being traded off. I, I don't think that's implausible, but um, it's not been systematically studied. So this is some, a surprising thing I found really from working on animal consciousness is that the sort of evidence from humans that one would like to guide an empirical research program into animals doesn't really exist or is more tentative than one might uh, hope. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a huge ongoing debate in human consciousness science about what, where the boundary is between conscious and unconscious perception. So given that, the, that there is that level of uncertainty in the human case, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to be of much help in, in uh, investigating animal consciousness. I guess it also highlights the importance of multiple tests, right? So, I mean, one of the things that... Um, I think we know reasonably for certain <laughs> uh, as far as anything is like that is that it's going to be sort of an inference to the best explanation um, rather than sort of one sort of one off there's going to be the test that we just sort of run um, and get the answer yeah yeah although that things, does yeah that, that does circle back around to the independence issue too right so you want robustness but you need independent measures so that's right yeah, yeah. maybe indexing different cognitive processes is one way to get that then you need to individuate the cognitive processes and so forth. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, Jonathan, do you want to? I also think a lot of indicators raise the probability of conscious experience a little bit without being smoking guns and you know, without being in any way conclusive. If well, we've already of, talked about behaviors, yeah. neurology, uh, genetics, you know, all of these things together sort of can lead us in to certain kind of points of view about whether or not something has consciousness rather than just one of them exactly being the smoking gun. I think so, yeah. And Liz was emphasizing that complex behaviors can be produced by simple mechanisms, but still finding that complex behavior can shift the probabilities a little bit yeah. if um, and shift them in the direction towards there being something with a similar, you know, a kind with a similar profile to conscious experience yeah. there for that animal. Yeah, so, maybe just, yeah. No, sorry, go ahead, Liz. Um, just kind of building on that point, 
one of the thing that I think is particularly fascinating about research on insect cognition is um, finding that they, they do seem to create these quite complex behaviors and quite sophisticated abilities on the basis of, you know, like five neurons and some clever molecular signaling that in us would take like a massive amount <laughs> of brain space. So like one way of thinking then is like, okay, so if we find evidence of this apparently complex behavior in insects, doesn't really mean anything because they're doing it with five neurons. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you also have to question about whether that's the, maybe the right inference to make, but it, yeah, um, it's something that is worth bearing in mind that the kinds of systems that human brains use to generate complex behaviors might be really, really quite different to other kinds of systems. And it's not really clear what to make of that necessarily. Yeah. Um, oh. I mean, one way of looking at it is just you know, human brains are absurdly inefficient yes. and wasteful. And then, yeah, then you can have a debate about whether the consciousness is part of the waste. You know? <laughs> um, but it, the, the fact that insects achieve similar things with a million neurons just points to the, the incredible uh, efficiency of the organization and the, the amount of computational work that individual neurons can do. Mm. Um, yeah, I think C. elegans with fewer than 400 neurons makes that point in an even clearer way. You know, every, every neuron matters and every neuron has to do quite a lot of computational heavy lifting yeah. for itself. But yeah, it'd be hasty to infer that there's some lower bound on the number of neurons you need for conscious experience and, and that we can confidently say what that is. I don't think we can. Yeah. So, I mean... I like this place we've gone to by thinking about sort of uh, a bunch of ind individual factors that, you know, as they are more or less present may shift our credences about consciousness a little bit one way or another. But in a sense, this really comes directly up against the application of these issues for policy and so forth. So uh, we talked a little bit in the last, the last uh, round table was about values in cognitive science. We talked a little bit about inductive risk, how to go about, um, uh, making decisions on the basis of science when the when the science is uncertain. Um, so it's it seems like this is a natural place to kind of hop in and say, well, okay, so we're looking at this complex science with a lot of in, individual factors and you know this kind of credence shifting kind of thing we we place we've ended at. But then of course we need to there are policy relevant uh, and ethics relevant upshots for these things as as I mentioned in the intro. Um, so I think it's a good time to assess the question of um, you know, how do we look at this complex and, and difficult science and, and try to do uh, uh, science and policy work on the basis of this? And uh, Jonathan, it seemed uh, I was going to ask you to start since maybe you can talk a little bit more about your your um, white paper or the you know your your general approach to this in your in your project. Yes, the report that came out in November last year, the review of evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans. Yeah, it's been quite an interesting time for animal sentience and the law in the UK, in that the government, following the UK leaving the, the European Union, wanted to enshrine respect for sentience in law in some way, in a way that would parallel what the clause about sentience in the Lisbon Treaty does for the EU. So they've been spending a long time over this, formulating this sentience bill that is going to create a duty on policymakers to regard animals as sentient beings and that they, they run straight into the problem of what the scope of that bill would be and, and which animals should the duty apply to so that was what they wanted advice on and that was what we what we advised on and we advised the inclusion of all cephalopods so octopuses squid cuttlefish and all uh, decapod crustaceans crabs lobsters crayfish shrimps in the scope of this bill and they accepted the recommendation which is nice so they amended the bill they did one of the things we recommended the report also contains lots of other recommendations as well which have not yet been implemented including things like um, regulation of extreme slaughter methods people will often drop lobsters into pans of boiling water takes them between two and three minutes to die with you know, a big storm of nervous system activity going on there's a risk there 
right? It's a risk that can be managed by not doing that. So we we recommended some regulation and some enforceable best practice guidance against this sort of thing. And that's not yet happened, but we hope, yeah, hope that the report will start a conversation. And I think to some extent it has conversation that might ultimately lead to some more substantial regulation to protect the welfare of some of these animals. Is it is it fair to say that we, I mean, should, should we err a little bit on the more credence side, given the, uh, you know, if, if we think that the suffering of sentient beings is bad, we might want to uh, lean a little bit towards the, the hypothesis that- They're on the side of caution. I think, I think erring on the side of caution is a very sensible thing to do. And so I've argued for it, applying the precautionary principle in effect to these yeah. questions. There's a asymmetry of risk, you might say, in that you know, the costs of regarding crabs and lobsters in particular as not sentient when they are, are to be measured in extreme suffering being caused to hundreds of billions of animals every year versus the costs of regarding them as non-sentient when they are sentient. It's not clear to me there really are costs because people in the shellfish industry suggest there might be costs, but I think producers that already have welfare standards and that try to avoid causing gratuitous suffering to the animals benefit from having those standards enforced and, and benefit from being protected against the erosion of standards by a total absence of regulation. So I'm not sure anyone really loses from erring on the side of caution in that case. That wasn't, ex that wasn't the case we actually made in our report. I mean, the case in the report was very much along the lines of consistency that animal welfare law in the UK already protects fish. The evidence here for these invertebrates is really at least as strong as for fish. So a consistent policy here would be to protect those invertebrates, which I think is another route to the same conclusion, essentially, um, if you don't want to rely on those asymmetry of risk considerations. Yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, you, you know, the even if we're not totally certain, um, doing the comparison work and, and making consistent policy as a way we can, can make the science relevant, I hadn't actually thought of that as a... As a as a possible application so yeah that's that's cool um, yeah i mean one drawback to the asymmetry of risk argument um plausible though it is you know is that there's sometimes a bit of suspicion that experts shouldn't be making those judgments and that it should be because they're value judgments about how bad certain things are they should be left to elected representatives and i can see the the force of that um Consistency, on the other hand, I think is, is something that can reasonably be left to experts. There's one advantage to focusing on that. I'm quite um, keen on the idea that these decisions should ultimately be made democratically. I'm quite keen on mechanisms like citizens assemblies or citizens panels, where you bring people together, you bring randomly selected members of the population together and put to them the question, what would be proportionate here? You know here's the evidence, here's the risks, what do you think would be proportionate? And I strongly suspect that kind of process would end up agreeing with our recommendations when it comes to things like dropping animals in pans of boiling water. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is really a fascinating sort of like democracy and science kind of, it runs directly into that. I yeah. think that's really, really interesting. Um, Rachel, Liz, do you, you guys want anything? Or? I mean, I was just going to say that I think this topic kind of goes background also to some of the earlier uh, questions we were, well, sort of ideas we were talking about, which is, I mean, in some sense, what we're interested in is not necessarily whether something is consciousness or, conscious or not, but the nature of their conscious experience and whether what they what their experience of um, whatever we're going to to do to them is because and and in some, and in a way that's partly highlights why it's so important to look at animal consciousness as well as human consciousness and learn more about these kind of grades and factors um, to do with the nature of experience um, because otherwise we can't really adequately assess something like yeah 
um, yeah, we're going to buy that um, the cephalopod is conscious, but um, then there's this question about, well, what's okay to, when are they suffering? Um, and that is something we can answer more by understanding better the levers under underlying kind of experience. Yeah, I think it's a good example of a case where we can identify a risk with very high confidence without necessarily having to be particularly certain at all about what consciousness is. Uh, the, the risk there is, is staring you in the face. It's also a relatively, I mean, as you've pointed out, the cost of actually acting is relatively low. So, I mean, yeah. given what people say about, about uh, insects, um, you might think that, you know, driving my car down the highway is pretty like bad thing to be doing in terms of um, risk. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm, I think we're, we're not advocating people don't go driving um, just because they might kill or, you know, in a nasty way, lots and lots of flies. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a big factor here. Yeah, I mean, I think proportionality is the crucial concept. As I mentioned earlier, you know, that's the question I would put to a citizens panel if I was convening one. What would be proportionate in relation to this risk? And I think you wouldn't end up with bans on driving coming out of that or bans <laughs> on stamping on insects. Because um, these things are ultimately not feasible, um, given the, the sort of way of life that we've collectively adopted. On the other hand, simple best practice guidance and regulation that stops totally untrained people causing gratuitous suffering is feasible and is proportionate. So that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. I think you're still on mute. At least once, at least once every video I do that. Um, uh, and, you know, thinking about how, how those conversant in the science can help mediate and, and articulate those uh, democratically important processes, I think, is 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 a nice um, thing to bring out. Um, uh, sorry, Liz, did you have anything to add? Or uh... um, yeah, kind of quickly. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, Jonathan has written lots on this already, um, and Rachel. Um, but in assessing where the risks might be, there's lots of really interesting work to do in in terms of figuring out how much evidence you really need in order to take seriously the idea that an organism might be sentient. Um, so there was a special issue in the Animal Sentience Journal on this. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's a difficult question because you kind of want enough evidence to convince people who might be a little bit skeptical, but not enough that it's that demanding. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think for me, one of the interesting things is it gets into kind of broader questions about what we count as scientific evidence and who counts as experts in this field. So is it going to include lab managers and people who work with livestock regularly and that kind of thing? Um, and, and standards of evidence as well, right? So yeah. who, who gets to decide on what the standards yeah. are for? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this brings us actually right into the last thing I wanted to talk about. And uh, several of us uh, have, have uh, commitments. I have office hours. Other of us have family issues to attend to. Um, so so uh, Rachel, I, need, I know you need to go soon. And so kind of cut out whenever you need to. But I just wanted to end it by asking specifically, you know, as philosophers, is there, is there a specific thing that philosophers can do in the kind of public sphere um, for this? So each of you has done sort of publicly engaged philosophy kind of um, in your own ways, is, is there uh, is there a specific benefit to having philosophers around, or is it uh, uh, is it something left to the public and the sciences? <laughs> so I, I don't know, Rachel. Do you have anything to, to say on this before you have to before you have to head up? I mean, I think that um, Jonathan's project really highlights the value that philosophers can bring to this space. Um, I guess the question is, do we bring value more often than not? Um, and you know, so. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, well, I'm biased, I'd say yes. <laughs> um, but I think it's often in, in that kind of integrative work, thinking about the big picture, what's the big picture that the science is telling us? And then, and that's partly something that we're good at because of the training that we have. Um, but also, uh, 
thinking about well what the the implications are for things like public policy which again is something that you know our our training is useful for so yeah for me I think that um what philosophers can bring to this is that big picture kind of um uh, viewpoint and but the key in that is actually to be engaged with the scientists so I think you know the the real peril is the person that's sort of just coming at it without actually get engaging in science with the science um and and when you do that, then you, yeah, that's where you sort of are likely to kind of do the bad kind of public philosopher, I think. But. Yeah, I would also, I'm not sure there's anything philosophers can do that no one else can do. You know, we're, uh, we're not irreplaceable. They didn't say we were unique. <laughs> <laughs> not irreplaceable. I think uh, a lot of the, the scientists that I work with and talk to about these issues there's a real aversion sometimes to, I suppose, to inductive risk, to taking inductive risks, to accepting uncertainty. There's often a really strong feeling that either you have conclusive evidence or you're speculating. And I think philosophers are much happier in that middle ground where we accept there are real limits on the availability of conclusive evidence in this area, but that doesn't mean we stop talking about it and go and look at something else it means instead we we think hard about where exactly we are in that spectrum from speculation to conclusive and what the evidence that we do have can actually support and how that might lead to appropriate action so i think that that sort of rough space in the middle there is one that scientists are not really trained to handle and people like me can step in and make proposals and say well, well here's a way we could handle this i guess i'm going to have to go there's a riot happening outside the door <laughs> i can hear some someone singing why aren't we leaving now so oh, I'll okay well, so, <laughs> Rachel, we'll, let you, we'll let you go and then we'll uh and then we'll, I'll, I'll close out with last thoughts from, from Liz. lovely to talk to you all thanks so much for joining really appreciate okay. it okay see you all right bye um yeah, uh, thanks for that, Jonathan. Liz, do you want do you want to have any uh, the last word here before we before we all head up? I can't actually remember what we were just talking about. So oh, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> role, of, role of philosophers in the, uh, oh, in the yeah. public discussions of these things. Yeah, no, I just basically to agree with Jonathan. Um, I mean, I think it's partly because if you have been working in animal welfare science for a long time, you probably had a lot of people shouting at you about how you shouldn't use the word consciousness. Yeah consciousness is not something that we can ever know anything about um whereas philosophers can use the word consciousness and do regularly freely um so i think given our discipline we uh we are less scared to talk about it as a concept and that's a useful right, yeah there's a sense in which the security of the standing of our discipline <laughs> doesn't rely on being able to con claim to have conclusively settled things Mm -hmm. yes. You could say that's the distinctive property of philosophers. <laughs> it is not, not always a useful one to society, but in this context, it's quite useful. Yeah. yeah and, and so I, I usually ask a version of this question towards the end of you know most of these. And the thing that really seems to be emerging is there is kind of like, there's nothing like cognitively totally unique about philosophers, but there are some kind of institutional and training um, uh, advantages but those come along with pretty heavy um, demands in terms of actually understanding the science, uh, actually, you know, um, uh, knowing the field from 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 both sides before you can actually serve that serve that role. Um, so so yeah, uh, we I, I like to end on the like optimistic like there's good work for philosophers to do while also uh, uh, stressing the the demands and the obligations of of doing that kind of work. So. <laughs> Good work for interdisciplinary researchers to do well and if they uh, happen to have one foot in philosophy all the better and uh we at the brains blog love that love that space that's where we that's where we kind of live so uh very, very happy if that's the if that's the outcome here as well so uh great okay well i think that's uh we're about out of time rachel has already had to uh go shuffle her kids off to school um so thank you uh thank you all uh including rachel but thank you uh both of you for joining. This has been really fun and uh, really looking forward to, to hosting this on the blog. Uh, thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's joined us today and join us for future iterations of Brains Blog Roundtables. Thanks. <laughs>